Hey, everybody, welcome. Today, we are going to be talking about chapter eight of the data management body of knowledge. The way this works is we'll do some quick introductions and we will have a session where we each independently study the DMBOC or your notes or read online about the chapter, whatever is helpful for you. And then we'll come back and we'll discuss anything that we found interesting or that we had questions about. We'll do three rounds of that. They're called Pomodoro Cycles. So we will review chapter eight, and then we'll come back together and talk about our findings or any questions that we have. I know that was sort of a short reading session, and I want to get to people's questions and comments about it. Okay, so my question is, in terms of the data integration series, how much will they be asking about how machine learning operations, like life cycles go into this? Or is that just considered something that is wrapped in? Like, how much does the DEMBOC consider all the things that are happening now and all the changes that are taking place and how so many things are moving now more towards cloud-based stuff? That kind of yeah. question. Yeah, that's a wonderful question. Well, the book was written in 2017, or sorry, it was published in 2017. So it's even worse than that. It was written before <laughs> that, which means that none of this stuff is tested on the exam. So they're very light on cloud governance. They're very light on machine learning. I hate saying this, the big data chapter. They really should have called it data science, but it's only 2% of the exam. The good news is you don't have to worry about it for now. The bad news is I'm sure they'll come out with an update and then I'll have to fix all my page numbers everywhere. Okay. And so in terms of the DEMBOC, then when you're taking the test, they're not updating the test. They're basing it still on the DEMBOC too. Yeah. The test is based on the reference material. So all you need okay. to pass for the fundamentals exam, especially is the DEMBOC. For specialist exams, it becomes a little bit more extra reading is appreciated. Fundamentals okay, cool. is really based on the one book. Thank you. Awesome. Great question. So at Coda, we have a lot of vendors, so we don't have any development activity per se, like mostly integration, right? So one of my thoughts is that I want to push the analytical data store to the vendor as well. Right now, we are trying to build data warehouse. We're not big enough to manage all that. So I would like vendor not only provide transactional data, but I would like them to build analytical data store as well. So I was just asking for the group, did anyone have success with vendors realizing that, okay, hey, data is valuable asset, and then providing both analytical as well as transactional data is important. Just checking with the group to see if you had success in convincing your vendors to provide both. I have a question for you. What do you mean with application transactional data? So are those just regular databases? Yeah, so we are a transit organization, right? Let's take, for example, rider information, like who's getting on the bus, who's getting out of the bus, at what time, and all this stuff, right? For that, we use a vendor-provided hardware on the buses, and then they have a back-end database for that. But we need analytics on what routes have more demand versus less demand and seasonal and all. Today, what we are trying to do is we are trying to get all that data from SQL Server and put it into data warehouse. So my thought is, is the, that, Sorry for interrupting you, but is the data streamed towards your applications? How does the data get ingested? Right now, it is not streamed. You should use a message broker probably for this case, because you have so much events you're talking about, people getting on the bus, off the bus. Those are yeah. events. And when you have a message broker, you can connect your databases to the message broker, but you can also connect analytical databases to your message broker that consume the same messages. And there are special databases made for consuming events and show real-time statistics on them with whatever query you like. And you can just define the query and then the stats will update live. So one-time query and the query will run automatically nonstop. Sure. What I'm trying to avoid is building all the stuff by ourselves. We are a very small organization, like 40 people. I'm trying to see if our vendors can build all that stuff and then provide me to data store. So I don't even have to worry about the streaming and anything like that. So that may be something new. My colleagues were saying that okay, it is hard to get vendors to do all those things. So I'm thinking that, okay, if anyone tried, or even if that makes sense in general to encourage software vendors to build analytical data store along with their application. I have no experience with external vendors. However, this is probably a professional itself doing the analysis and sending up the correct databases. All right. Thank you, Hilko. Yeah, you're welcome. This is about processing data, right? And getting useful information out of it. 
Yeah, so basically my thought is that, okay, I don't want to worry about building analytical data store and then all the integrations related to that. Vendors are SMEs for that. All I want is like, hey, give me analytical data store along with your transactional data store. So I don't want to put load on our transactional data store. And also that may not be well suited for analytical purpose. I think the answer remains the same. Look into data streaming and see if you can hook up an analytical database towards one of the message brokers. You can run your own statistics and only you can get the information you want. The technology is already there. Yeah. yeah, the current goal is to use EDC on the database and then stream it out. Yeah, because for example, how is the Uber taxi company? That's also running real-time statistics with this concept. They stream real time their events towards specialized databases where you can do any analytics you want. Yeah, we don't necessarily need real time analytics, even though that would be useful. <laughs> as soon as you start with it, you can't do that, probably. <laughs> That's cool. Thank you. Good question. Okay, so we are silently studying again for another 15 minutes, and then I'll see you back here at the end. I can also share a couple of slides on integration and interoperability. So this is just a preview of some longer content. I won't go through it all, but basically, as you know by now, integration and interoperability covers how data is consolidated and moved between systems within an organization or perhaps even across organizations. And it is 6% of the questions on the CDMP fundamentals exam. Little fun fact, they actually added this chapter when they went from DMBOK 1 to DMBOK 2 because they felt it was an important enough concept that it deserved its own topic. And it's represented here in the Aiken framework, which is kind of a visual display of the various levels of data strategy. It's in the middle integration layer. I'll tell you about the definitions and then I'll tell you a very short story. Essentially, data integration is merging data from various data sets into a unified data set. Related but slightly different concept, data interoperability is actually much more facilitating easy integration, and it may not be bringing together things into a unified form. So if we're talking about views, for example, this is like letting the data be read by a system, but not actually moving the data to that system. It's a virtual kind of integration. So that's something that you'll read about in this chapter if you haven't already. This is just an example of why data integration is so important. Actually, this is data interoperability. Well, it's both. But basically, there was a lot of money and effort and energy spent on creating this mission to Mars. In 1989, the Mars Climate Orbiter was meant to do a lap around our celestial neighbor and go around the atmosphere of Mars. However, Lockheed Martin, they were a subcontractor for NASA for this project. And they had designed the commands to be sent in pounds seconds. Whereas NASA had been accepting the international standard Newton seconds. Because of this, they were having some issues with the orbiter. And unfortunately, it got too close to the atmosphere of Mars and it burned up rather than being able to successfully complete its investigative mission. So this is very tragic. It actually curtailed space exploration for several years. NASA then really did internal quality assessment because of the failure of this mission, and it put a damper on space exploration for many years. Anyway, just wanted to highlight that mistake as an example of the importance of data integration and interoperability. With that, I will turn it back over to you guys. I just have a general question, maybe to open up the conversation. Do people have any experience with problems in transferring data between systems, like in their businesses and the things that went wrong and reason why and things like that? Just curious in general. I can give my experience with my previous employer. So we decided to build information hubs. Like you bring data from various systems and then put them into hubs based on the domain. I think the problem, not necessarily building the hubs, about the expectations that were set to the management, both business and IT. The amount of work that is required to build an information hub. I think this integration talks a little bit about building hubs, right? And was grossly underestimated. So that's one of the reasons that effort failed. But the idea of information hubs is really an interesting one, well built, and that would be a great one to decouple systems from each other. 
So was it too difficult? Or was it too time consuming? Or? The source systems, right? They were built 20 years ago. The data model was not kept up to date. We have the latest business model. So the information hubs try to keep in sync with the current business model. So there is some impedance mismatch. So that's where the complexities came to build that information hub. So it took time to right. build. All right. Thanks. Yeah, I'll just say from my experience, I had a client when I was in data strategy consulting, and it was a government agency where they were having data quality issues across the board. And so certain departments were unwilling to share their data with other departments. When we talked about data security, I think someone brought up the idea of data that is so protected that it's impossible to use, that it's actually being protected from use within the business or organization. So that's not ideal. I think this is a more common challenge, unfortunately. Um, so it was more a human thing than It was a, a unwillingness to yes. integrate. Yeah, where integration Ugh. was possible, <laughs> but the silos were put in place because the finance team was like, you guys have abused our data in the past. So I'm not sure totally the context around this, but it was due to a past history of feeling like their data was getting misinterpreted or was not sufficiently protected. And then they were just like, nope, we're closing it down. All right. That's interesting. Yep. <laughs> All right. Do other folks have things that they want to chat about during the break? So I can share like one of the things that we have done to share data while protecting the identity between two organizations. I used to work for a private aviation organization dealing with wealthy customers. And Amex Black Card deals with wealthy customers. So the sales department between these two organizations wanted to know how many of our customers are mutual customers so that they can provide a specific targeted product for those individuals. But neither organization wanted to share the identities of the people they wanted to protect. So they worked with our security team. So what we have done is that we identified a few fields that we think that are uniquely identify their identity. And then we had both information in both systems. We built a hash using Bcrypt and then shared hashes rather than sharing the identities themselves. So those hashes were built with the salt and all the stuff, even though these two organizations had NDA, but still they did not trust each other. So instead of sharing data, if all you want is matching information, so creating a hash and then sharing that hash probably is a viable option when people don't trust each other. I think we just figured out a new topic for this chapter in the, the Embark version 3, because the human aspect is not really discussed, I think, in the Embark, is it? They have a chapter on change management, but it's I mean, like refusing to share data because yeah. I don't want it. It's like, <laughs> nope. Right. Like group therapy mediated by the Dambach. Right. Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> We're coming up with so many topics for books. I do hope when they update it, maybe they can include a little bit more around this challenge. Okay. With that, I'm going to take us into our next study session. We still have a few minutes to wind down if folks have any additional questions or comments about this topic, data integration. The second word is just a nightmare for me, not being native English. I think In now you're obligated to try. Interoperability. <laughs> that was good. Yeah, that was totally fine. <laughs> it is a weird one for sure. Yep. All right. Thank you guys so much for coming. We do this every month and guided study sessions at the end of the month for members. So please come to those and yeah, see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>